we're now active. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm Donna Frazier, the Vice President of KRU, and I welcome everybody to this session of the KRU 2020 conference. Um, today's session, the explosive world of esports and online gaming. Um, a few housekeeping things I want to um, just remind all of the um, participants and attendees is um, all of your microphones will be muted. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available online. You'll receive an email of how to access that recording. And if anyone is having any problems connecting or hearing any technical issues, please immediately contact support at bbbnp.org anytime during this session. Um, I also encourage you to take a look at our upcoming sessions for the KVU Conference Virtual Series. We have some really fantastic um, sessions lined up each month. Um, August is Safety by Design. September um, is Copily Ever After, um, which for many of those who are on the line understand that um, COPPA is um, unusually a hot topic now more so than ever in part because of the, um, the FTC's rule review that's ongoing. So I would encourage you to sign up for that. And um, obviously October we have um, a featured speaker from LEGO and in November we'll be talking about diversity and inclusion. So please um, go to kbluconference.org to find out more about how to register for our sessions. Um, today and all of our sessions are not possible without our sponsors, so I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, Google, Hypershift, Keller & Heckman, Microsoft, Super Awesome, Venable, Monat, Baker Hostetler, and last, certainly but not least, is Davis & Gilbert. So at this time, I'm going to hand over um, the microphone to our two speakers, Joel Emmons and Melissa landau Steinman. Thank you. All right, uh, Donna, thank you uh, for the intro and for the opportunity to, to join you all today. And thanks to KRU, uh, the national programs team, uh, and Ray, Christina, Donna, and uh, the IT team for putting this all together. Um, I know we originally planned for this to look very different in March. Uh, so missing seeing you all in person, but uh, happy to join you from a, uh, a, remote, a remote cabin in the Cascades uh, up in Washington. I've gone about trying to make it look like a, a real place. So uh, joined by uh, Litton, one of my Pokemon friends. Uh, my name is Joel Emmons. I'm an Associate General Counsel at uh, the Pokemon Company International uh, and TPCI as we abbreviate it, uh, is responsible for representing uh, the Pokemon Company and brand worldwide outside of Asia. Uh, in my role specifically, I work with uh, my team and some legal specialists uh, to support about 80% of the company's uh, frontline business needs, uh, including around esports, competitive gaming, uh, marketing, advertising, and working closely with our privacy folks, uh, some of who are actually on the call today as participants. Um, so that, that is my introduction. I will hand it over to Melissa uh, for an intro and then we'll dive right in. Sure. Hi, I'm Melissa Steinman. Um, I am a partner at the Venable Law Firm. Um, uh, I work with a mix of companies like Joel's um, and uh, um, various uh, tech and media companies and of course just general CPG and the like um, in advertising promotions um, uh, and, and similar related matters um, and of course uh, have a lot of experience working on promotions and gaming matters um, in addition to matters relating to children. And so the intersection is kind of what brings us here today um, to talk about um, the sometimes explosive <laughs> world of esports and online gaming. Um, uh, I think we, we adopted the term um, uh, simply because it, it's growing quickly. Um, so we'll move on to, to talk about the subject matter of the day. And uh, next slide. Right. So we thought we would start and spend a few minutes just talking about esports um, and talking about sort of the inspiration for the topic today. Uh, we shared around a mail in, in October and November of last year. Um, Chance the Rapper was on Saturday Night Live and did this great uh, segment. Um, as a sports reporter, a, a basketball specialist who got pulled in to sub uh, for an esports commentator, 
because that esports commentator was off taking his uh, PSAT. Um, a nod to the fact that uh, esports is popular among teenagers. Uh, but you know, we, we don't have the video to show, although I will encourage everyone to go out to YouTube after this and go check it out because it's hilarious. Um, but the, the quote that kind of that caught me that I thought was appropriate was, you know, Chance as, as Laszlo Holmes, the, uh, the commentator, is mystified by what's going on around him and summarizes his experience as saying, I just saw 10 nerdy dudes sitting down at computers with headsets on while 20,000 people screamed like they were watching the Beatles. I did not know this was a thing. Um, that, that's really the genesis and the, the, where we wanted to start today, right? Esports is a thing. Um, although it definitely feels like this cultural, maybe generational phenomenon um, where unless you're, uh, you know, as Melissa put it, unless you have uh, teenage boys or just teenagers generally or kids getting into it, um, you may not know this is a thing. Um, so, you know, presentation over, yes, esports is a thing. Uh, but really the goal today, we'll, we'll cover some discussion around the esports industry generally and sort of the, uh, the economic rationale for why publishers want to get into it. Uh, and then do our best to walk through a number of legal issues associated with esports and specifically with kids being involved. Um, we are not going to be able to deep dive into everything. Um, because there are so many issues involved, but we'll do our best to, to cover through things. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so uh, eSports defined. Um, inherently multiplayer games with an origin in arcade-based games and home-based games where it's player versus player, um, or in some cases, player versus computer. Uh, taking a quick walk down memory lane of eSports, uh, one of the first events to be credited as esports um, was a video game contest that happened at Stanford University uh, in 1972. Uh, a bunch of students got together and competed in a game called Space War. And the, uh, the grand prize at the time was a year-long subscription to Rolling Stone magazine. Um, so as I get through this slide, you'll see that we've come a long way from a year-long subscription to Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, fast forward to 1980. Uh, there was a 10,000 participant Space Invaders Championship that got a lot of uh, worldwide press and attention. Um, and subsequently, sort of a lot of references in pop culture and media that was created after that. Um, when you really start to see the ball rolling on esports, uh, you're talking about some of the, um, the home player versus player video games of the 90s, thanks in large part to um, the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. And games, I'll throw in a plug like uh, Pokemon trading cards and Magic the Gathering. Um, you started to see the competitive scene around those uh, IPs, both digital and non-digital, becoming part of the standard fare for marketing and promoting and building community around products. Um, and then where you really start to see the connect with, uh, with today is in the late 90s and the 2000s uh, when the internet became ubiquitous. And games like Quake and StarCraft at online player versus player modes uh, activated. And that turned into um, more of a competitive scene. Uh, you started to see prizes uh, increase in size and player base increase as well. Um, I will do a quick sort of 20 year fast forward uh, to where we are today and to set the, to set the scene for why, why it matters. Um, the Fortnite World Championship and the Dota 2 International prize pools, both of those last year, each had their own pools in excess of $30 million uh, for the tournaments. Um, to put it in context, that's about the same as the FIFA Women's World Cup, uh, the last one, the overall prize pool. Uh, and a lot of press was written about uh, the Fortnite World Championship last year and that the, the winner brought home a check for $3 million, which was actually about 150% of what Tiger Woods uh, won in his last Masters victory. Um, so setting the context a bit, on the, uh, on the content um, access side, not just the gameplay, but the viewership has also dramatically increased. Uh, we all know about Twitch. We know about YouTube and their YouTube gaming platform. Uh, until recently, Microsoft had Microsoft Mixer. Uh, its user base has now moved over to Facebook gaming or has been being transitioned. Um, 
But so these are all new and large platforms uh, that have cropped up to really support the esports ecosystem. And we're talking about um, you know over 40 million concurrent views for some of the larger uh, tournaments. Uh, League of Legends, their Twitch channel has over a billion views in lifetime as of uh, early 2019. So we're talking about major numbers uh, that even traditional broadcasters uh, have never seen the likes of, even though traditional broadcasters still do uh, play into the ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll, we'll break this down quickly, um, but suffice it to say, there are a wide range of stakeholders within the esports ecosystem. Uh, and it all starts with the publisher. Uh, Imagine, if you will, that the National Football League not only controlled the franchise rights to the NFL and teams uh, and the broadcast rights to the NFL, but they controlled the actual game of football. They could tell people how and when they could play football. Um, that's really what we're talking about with esports, because if we're talking about pieces of software uh, that are subject to license agreements and intellectual property rights, um, primarily copyright, uh, the publisher has the ability to dictate how those products are used. Um, so everything starts with the publisher in esports and they get to dictate uh, how products are used. Now what you end up with there is um, a, a sort of a mesh of, of different stakeholders where publishers will license outrights to uh, organizations to run independent tournaments. They may run their own tournaments. Uh, they may franchise leagues and individual teams to run tournaments based on their IP. Um, and so you really get into this massive ecosystem really quickly. Uh, and it, it's critical from the legal side to identify who is involved, who are the stakeholders, what is their responsibility, because there are serious liability um, uh, consequences for answering that, right? Do we have data controller and processor issues? Um, was the legal or the, the local law compliance? And we'll get into more of that later. Uh, who is doing IP clearance? Um, you know, so, so it quickly becomes a lot of information gathering that needs to happen. Um, but uh, it's important to take away the publisher controls absent uh, the publisher relinquishing rights to certain stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Right, so we'll, we'll talk about quickly the, um, the primary revenue sources for publishers in esports. Um, this is a gross oversimplification of what's becoming a very sophisticated um, industry. Um, but I, I'll kind of tease out uh, what I'll say are, um, you know, goals one, two, and uh, sort of third goal that ties in if you can get goal one and two accomplished. Um, because as we think about the legal ramifications, we have to think about the business motivations behind them um, so we can really understand the issues. So a lot of publishers see esports with a primary goal of generating revenue through player retention and engagement. Um, and that's mainly exciting the player base, getting them to come back to um, you know, either buy the underlying software again, buy new expansions, new downloadable content, um, really to engage the player base, but fundamentally driving the revenue source back to the underlying um, IP and product. Uh, the closest approximation I could give you in traditional sports would be season ticket sales for uh, you know, an NFL franchise, for example. It, it's the similar mechanism of encouraging people to spend the money uh, to come back to enjoy the core product again. Um, what's unique though about esports is goal number two, um, where really some publishers are seeing this not as a way to monetize the underlying IP asset, um, but really to uh, turn the, the gameplay of that into entertainment itself and to increase viewership uh, as a standalone product, right? And that, that's akin in a lot of ways to the traditional media model where a sports franchise will go out and exclusively license the rights to broadcasting all of the games for a season for a specified sum. Uh, and, and we see a lot of this and it's notable in 2018, uh, Twitch did a deal with Activision Blizzard um, for Overwatch League. And uh, you know they, it was a $90 million license or 90 million plus. Um, so there, there is real money here and broadcasters 
and particularly streaming broadcasters are paying good money to get the exclusive rights just to broadcast. Um, but as we'll, as we'll dig into a little bit later, uh, there are issues around both of these two goals, right? Um, for goal number one, you end up with an incentive to create, you know, potentially microtransactions or to drive sales of subscription models. Uh, season passes is a term that's used a lot. Uh, in goal two, you end up with, um, you know, a primary motivator of selling advertisements uh, to go along with the content streams. And so you run into issues around endorsement and advertising liability. Uh, goal three, which I will, I will say is sort of the icing on the cake, is uh, when esports IPs have arrived and they've developed the mechanisms to either hit on goal one or two or both, um, they tap into the merchandise market. And merchandising is really a, a critical area of revenue generation around esports, uh, in part because one of the most popular modes of merchandise is actually digital merchandise, in game uh, items like shirts and hats and items. Uh, and the profit margin on those things is can or can be phenomenal because they're digital items and infinitely replicated uh, unless the the publisher has put for scarcity on it. Um, so and we'll dig into some of the issues around that as well as we go on. Uh, next slide, please. And this is where I will stop talking and hand it over to Melissa to start talking about the, the more complicated legal elements. We need a little variety here. Yeah. Um, There's a crash course on esports. So, in terms of what laws apply to esports, um, of course, you know, most of us are probably lawyers here. Um, there's very little in terms of regulation in the US that is specifically applicable to esports. In, um, in other countries, there's been some movement um, uh, to specifically regulate it. Um, in the U.S., however, um, most of the, uh, the function when it comes to sort of current movement on, on regulating um, electronic sports, shall we say, has been on either fantasy sports um, or sports betting, um, uh, which, we, uh, which we could spend a day-long conference and many do talking about. Um, in France, there's been uh, legislation recently passed that regulates esports player contracts. France, of course, is, you know, famous for being um, uh, for being protective of its its workers. Um, so that's that's been um, recent activity. And in the UK, um, the Gambling Commission signed uh, an MOU with the Esport Integrity Coalition. Um, the UK has probably seen actually the most activity with respect to talking about how do we protect children playing esports. So it's sort of an, um, a country to watch on that. Um, in the US, when we talk about what laws are, are relevant to the regulation of esports, it's sort of pulling a little bit from here and a little bit from there. Um, uh, sort of the top four that we're going to talk about today are gaming, um, gambling, and lotteries. Um, the, uh, the endorsements and testimonials rule, which of course um, uh, we've seen a number, of, a number of cases coming out of uh, KRU already um, talking about. Intellectual property, which, which Joel has already alluded to um, the complexity uh, regarding to when it comes to this area. And then privacy, um, uh, where there's, there's obviously been a lot of activity and we're collecting potentially personal information from all the players who may or may not be children. Um, so, so that's going to be um, a very interesting area and we'll discuss it in some detail. Um, uh, also potentially, of course, you've got the player contracts, you've got contracts with different sponsors, um, uh, employment, um, cryptocurrency and AML, which we'll talk about just a bit, claims and advertising claims. Um, so sort of a, a panoply of areas that can be um, implicated here. Next slide. Um, of course, when we talk about KRU, we're interested in talking about children. Um, uh, there's been an increasing presence in esports, um, uh, which of course there's, we think about the players who are professionals or who are um, college students, which is where the most activity has been, but 
uh, you've got to have theaters into college. And in, partic uh, in particular, there's an increasing number of college scholarships. Um, so parents are happy to hear that, you know, the kid who they can't get off their games, well, now at least it may be productive. Um, so we're seeing now more and more um, uh, after school leagues, um, school district leagues, community leagues, um, and, and even ed tech, where you've got uh, K through 12 schools, educational curricula um, that are incorporating um, esports into it. Um, uh, there's increasing evidence that um, esports can have positive effects when it comes to STEM learning, um, things like uh, understanding scientific methodology, using data and evidence, or of course, just basic technological. Um, proficiency um, and general positive benefits. So um, there are uh, a number of different companies who have gotten into the sort of ed tech field um, who are building different games and the like um, and promoting them for esports. Um, uh, there is an organization, the National Association of Collegiate Esports, who's been um, who's the main governing uh, body for varsity esports. There are also high school organizations. Um, and other school organizations um, who are involved in scholarships um, and, and other educational um, sort of endeavors, uh, uh, as well as standards for, for esports and similar ed tech activities. Next slide. Uh, the thing is, when we talk about esports, um, we've got many, uh, and kids, we've got many more concerns beyond the, the adult play. Um, so there's things like COPA, um, uh, the gaming websites that we're talking about, to the extent that they include features like voice communication, instant messaging, or a lot of them involve boards, forums, or sort of side sideline websites for communication, Example would be Discord, where you may not be um, in the game, but it's a, a, a program that's used for communicating. Um, you know, issues may come up like online bullying or even, you know, stalking by criminals who may communicate, hey, come meet me offline, IRL, uh, in real life. Um, and how do you protect children um, uh, in such situations. It's not necessarily a new issue. Um, we've seen it in other situations where children are online, um, but it's certainly present and you need to be thoughtful about it when we're talking about esports and gaming activities. Um, there's also just the basic ability to consent um, when you have a child um, who is uh, participating um, or a minor who's participating in esports activities, how do you ensure um, that uh, that that child or that minor um, is uh, providing uh, consent. How do you involve the parent um, uh, in those activities with um, a gaming website that may be targeted um, towards the general website or you know is is really envisioned as being targeted primarily for adults. So next slide. So delving more deeply into the regulatory um, uh, framework. Next slide. First, when we talk about the gaming and gambling laws, um, ultimately what you want to in, uh, avoid whenever you're talking about um, esports activities is you want to make sure that it's not illegal gambling. Um, uh, when uh, we're talking about illegal gambling um, or uh, an unlawful lottery, um, you want to make sure that all three elements um, of illegal gambling are not present, um, which is prize, chance, and consideration. Um, so typically, um, uh, the argument that esports um, uh, are not unlawful is simply that um, chance isn't present. It's a skill contest. Um, therefore, you can have um, uh, in situations where you've got a tournament, um, which is typically fee-based. You've got an entry fee. Um, perhaps you have certain equipment that's required to participate. Um, so you have that consideration um, present, which of course is 
um, uh, very similar, if not the same as the typical contract-based consideration that we all learn about um, uh, in, in uh, contracts class in law school. Um, even a peppercorn can be enough. Um, uh, but uh, the states can have different rules about whether a fee-based skill contest um, is legal or not. Um, some states will, uh, for instance, prohibit um, even non-monetary um, uh, consideration, the uh, devotion of hours of gameplay, for instance. Um, and uh, states can have different rules as well um, uh, for whether they will permit um, mixed games of chance and skill. Um, so to the extent that there is any chance um, uh, uh, integrated into um, uh, your game of skill, your skill-based competition, um, in different states that, can, that may mean that your um, skill-based competition is illegal. That can be important in, in situations, say, where there's you know, a tiebreaker that involves chance whether it's a random drawing or a flip of a coin or, or whatever it is. Um, uh, in the states that say there can't be any chance um, in your skill contest, um, you may have an illegal, um, uh, illegal lottery or illegal gambling if you've got um, uh, any chance um, in your tiebreaker or any other element for that matter, whether it's, you know, say in your early rounds, um, of your competition. Um, uh, there, there frequently can be um, chance even in how you select the people who get to compete in the first place. Um, so these are things that have to be taken into account in um, designing an esports competition um, or tournament um, uh, and um, you know, may or may not be spoken to specifically in the context of esports, but certainly need to be analyzing. Um, at this point, uh, uh, the, the federal laws are less important than the state laws when you're doing this analysis. Um, uh, so it's often a state-by-state -state analysis, um, which can make it very tricky. I'll, I'll just jump in quickly on this. Um, as Melissa has spoken about, you know, state-by-state -state analysis in the, in the U.S., um, this industry is emerging so quickly uh, that you know states are taking very different approaches to this it's very clear across the board government and industry alike nobody wants kids to be gambling um, but how the states are approaching that question and uh, you know frankly how much they're taking esports specifically into consideration is sort of across the board um, so it makes things complicated from a legal standpoint and i'll say go get competent local counsel wherever you can to really dig deep on this um, wherever you intend to have uh, your tournaments operating. Um, one thing I want to note, you know, from, from sort of an in-house perspective, uh, Melissa's had a call out there, of, you may need to change aspects of the game. Um, that can be very thorny and very tricky to explain inside to your development teams um, that they need to change the game. And in some, some situations, right, you there needs to be a very pragmatic conversation about whether you change a game or you make it not available in certain areas um, because game development has a lead time. Modifications to games have a lead time. Um, so there's real material business considerations there. Um, Melissa's has eliminated some of the mechanisms you can use though to sort of navigate this, right? Altering the game, removing chance or predominant chance where, where necessary. Um, excluding jurisdictions, locating events or even servers and systems in certain locations to make sure that there's uh, you're complying. Um, and then it, probably the, the one that's it's maybe difficult to sell for some folks on the business side, um, but modifying the consideration and the value proposition and really structuring the mechanics of how the tournament operates, independent of how the the game itself operates, right? A lot of times tournament operation and game operation, they, they go hand in hand, but they can be separated out and, um, and manipulated differentially to, to get you into compliance. Very true. Um, next slide. 
the one part of, of a game may be um, skin betting. Um, this is not necessarily true of every game or competition, but it's very common. Um, many games um, have what's called skins or virtual tokens that may be things like guns or potions or swords, tools. If, um, if any of you have played Farmville, um, not a competition game necessarily, but something that we're all familiar with, you could buy, you know, certain certain implements or items um, uh, to advance gameplay more quickly or more efficiently. Um, players often in, in games may gather skins um, uh, during gameplay, and then um, they may bet them or sell them or trade them um, uh, as part of sort of the economy of the game. Um, uh, that, that practice of skin betting exists in something of a gray area. Um, uh, in many um, uh, games, there's no real money off, um, up for grabs rather. Um, so it's not necessarily, um, at least under some analyses, um, uh, betting. Um, but to the extent that you have to monitor this sort of thing carefully, because to the extent that um, there's the ability to purchase skins, or if they're either in the game or on a secondary market, and then um, you have this kind of betting um, uh, or, uh, you know, this extensive market that it may raise issues either under the gambling laws um, or under even the, the virtual currency and money laundering laws to the extent that you have skins um, that may be considered a thing of value. Um, so if you do have a game where you get this kind of economy that develops, um, where you have either sort of purchase on the front end, and especially if you have um, then trading and cashing out on the back end, um, you have to sort of assess whether you may potentially have either gambling or, or um, virtual currency issues that have developed. Next slide. For the endorsements and testimonials rules, um, I think many of us may be familiar at this point. This has been an activity where um, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, where the NAD and KRU have all been active. Um, uh, but of course, where, where there's a connection between um, the endorser and the seller um, to get down to brass tacks of an advertised product that might materially affect the weight or credibility of an endorsement. Um, uh, and that uh, connection is not reasonably expected by the audience, um, that connection must be fully disclosed. Um, so corporate sponsorships um, are extraordinarily common in esports. Um, players uh, are asked to advertise um, the sponsorships, products, um, uh, all sorts of things on social media. They're given freebies. Um, uh, you know, their sponsors may fly them to tournaments. Um, there's all manner of connections. Um, and so uh, the players um, uh, may or may not be fully compliant um, with the endorsements and testimonials rules. And it's important to the extent that you are sponsoring a player that you make sure that those um, players understand um, uh, their responsibilities and then, of course, monitor um, and enforce, um, as the FTC has sort of made clear, is, is your responsibility. And then to the extent that you are a player, um, uh, that, that you comply. These players are young. Um, uh, getting younger every day, they're brash, they don't want to, you know, necessarily, they love the money, but they don't necessarily want to muddy up their, um, what they're saying on their, their feeds, on their Twitch feeds, on their, you know, Instagrams, whatever. Um, so they, they aren't always um, disclosing properly, and it's important to sort of keep track of, of what they're saying and to make sure they understand. The other thing is that um, the media that they are, um, you know, that they're talking um, about 
uh, the various companies they're they're repping as as they say um, is uh, is not necessarily always the traditional media that that we're um, used to. So Twitch is, of course, probably the best known of some of the streaming media. Um, but um, there are others like like Discord, which, we, which we've mentioned, or um, or the like, and it's important to sort of parse through um, uh, where where these um, endorsers may be um, may be making disclosures and make sure they're doing so properly. Next slide. One of the next slide. One of the best known cases actually at the FTC um, uh, it involves. Um, uh, this industry. Um, it involves two um, uh, popular YouTubers. This is the FTC versus um, uh, CS uh, Go Lotto. Um, it involves two YouTubers um, who actually owned uh, the company. It was Trading Skins, um, and they owned the company that they were posting about um, and also um, uh, worked with a lot of um, well-known influencers um, uh, who were who were tra trading skins um, on their on their app, and so um, they did not make disclosures. Um, uh, none of the influencers were were doing a particularly good job making disclosures. Some were making them, but they almost always were doing it below the fold. Um, and so this was the first case that the FTC brought um, directly against influencers for failure to disclose under the rule. Um, and you can see here um, some of um, uh, the um, uh, the posts that our friends um, uh, Trevor Martin and Tom uh, Castle um, made. Uh, no disclosures there. Um, so these are sort of you know typical um, typical disclosures. Next slide. Um, so you see the CSGO Lotto um, uh, case here, and then there's also uh, KRU has brought a couple of actions against child influencers. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not just the adults who can get in trouble. Um, there were Evan Tube and Ryan Toys, who um, uh, two child influencers who failed to disclose their material connection with companies um, who provided, you know, payment, free product and the like. Um, even young esports players um, can get in trouble for failing to disclose, um, and in fact, they're they're especially vulnerable in the sense that um, they they may have a limited understanding of their responsibilities um, and and require you know particularly uh, be particularly in need of guidance. Um, you know, this is something where a simple clause in a contract that says you must make disclosures in compliance with the, endor with the endorsements and testimonials rule is, um, you know, of questionable effectiveness. Um, you can't just contract your liability away. Um, it's important um, to make sure that um, these young people understand their responsibilities. Um, it's going to be a lot harder to go back and clean it up later. I will just jump in very, very briefly, uh, Melissa, to echo what you said, right? This is, uh, this is a high risk area. The, the CSGO Lotto case was egregious, blatant endorsement issues, not, not kids and adults separated, but just generally, right? Um, when it comes to esports and kids, we have to look at those situations. We've also got to hold the higher expectations of, uh, endorsements focused on kids with the Evan tube and, uh, you know, Ryan's Toys cases. So this becomes a particularly thorny issue, not just for publishers, but really for uh, any of the players in the ecosystem who are contracting out to endorsers. As you said, liability rolls upstream uh, when it comes to uh, endorsement. So, uh, you know, you combine that with, with the younger demographics, both of the, the target audience and the uh, influencers, uh, and, you know, Folks need to go above and beyond, um, and I will just put a plug in to any uh, outside counsel who are sitting on this call or people looking to uh, to go into esports from an outside counsel perspective. There is huge value and market in making sure that there is 
good advice and guidance out there to uh, players of all ages in esports um, who find themselves making serious money, having serious, uh, you know, footprint, right, from a popularity standpoint, um, and need the sophisticated counsel uh, to move along quickly. Uh, a lot of times, you know, the the mom or dad or parent uh, is the is the counsel, is the manager, is the uh, is the lawyer, is the agent in these situations, um, to the extent they're even thinking about needing those sort of specializations. Um, so lots of opportunity here, I'd say. I was talking with Joel when we were preparing for this, and I I had spoken with a woman who calls herself the esports mom, and she essentially acts as a chaperone for a lot of these younger kids going to to the tournaments. Um, and helps them understand what their responsibilities are with things like, um, uh, you know, disclosures and compliance with the endorsements and testimonials rules and entering into contracts and, and that sort of thing. But of course, you're only as good as your esports mom or your parent or, um, or whoever, you know, your buddy who does this too. Um, or, you know, whoever it is who gave you the last, last piece of advice you got. And so, um, you know, to the extent that you are able to give advice, um, you're going to get much, um, you know, or, or give guidance with that agreement, have a good policy. Obviously, you don't want to, you know, be giving legal advice, but um, to somebody you don't represent. But to the extent that you as the sponsor have a good policy that's coming with the agreement that may go a very long way um, uh, towards helping these these youngsters um, uh, comply. I just wanna jump in one more time because I, there's a great question from Kate in the chat about um, guidance, asking for guidance on whether esports coaches can be um, consenters for kids PII collection use instead of the parent. Um, I personally don't have a great answer on that, but I think it's a, great question. And, you know, I think it's probably very problematic from privacy standpoint. Um, but this is something, you know, one of those spaces where I think uh, practice will have to develop very quickly, uh, as you're seeing esports moms and esports coaches trying to step in and be these advisors to kids. I mean, I think at this point, you would have to have sort of guardianship, um, yeah. in, or, you know, consent in some, in some guise as specifically required by one of the various acronyms of privacy laws um, that, that we're all dealing with worldwide. Yes. Um, next slide. So another key issue here is intellectual property, um, uh, you know, copyright, trademark, the right of publicity. Um, there's a lot of user generated content online, um, the use of pictures of the players um, uh, is obviously widespread. Um, so all of this sort of thing can, can implicate intellectual property issues. Um, also trademarks and logos of, um, of the, the games themselves um, uh, and the sponsors. So the right of publicity um, is what prevents the unauthorized commercial use of um, uh, the player's uh, name, likeness, um, or other recognizable aspects of, of one's persona. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, player picks, names, potentially gamer tags, um, if they're identifiable, um, that sort of thing. Um, then you have copyright issues um, in the sense that they'll protect pictures, videos, written content posted online, all of that sort of user-generated content. Um, so to the extent that you're a company that wants to use um, players, photos, or names, or content, um, you're going to need to um, get their, con uh, their, their consent, or if they're a minor, get their um, uh, parents' consent. Um, uh, and uh, you're going to want to be proactive about thinking about um, you know, what kind of content do we want to get um, from these players um, uh, and, and get those releases? Um, uh, to the extent that you are planning a tournament, um, uh, this can be particularly important 
Um, you know, it may be from the sign up stage. Um, uh, you want to be thinking about how am I getting consent um, to use player footage, um, to use pictures on the website. Um, uh, if you're having, you know, a, a live tournament, you know, do you want to use video footage from the floor? Um, uh, but then there's also the, the question of, um, do you want to use footage of um, tournament attendees and how do you, how do you get that, which is sort of a classic question with events, um, you know, is a sign enough, which is, um, you know, that, that warns, is there a sign at the entrance that says you may be filmed um, and will that work, which is kind of a jurisdiction by jurisdiction question. Um, uh, and, you know, maybe a matter of kind of the law combined with um, uh, tolerance of risk combined with what kind of uses do you want to make. Um, you know, if it's a matter of, you know, just sort of fleeting glimpses of people in the crowd, the analysis may be different um, than if you want to sort of focus in um, and, uh, you know, take pictures where there's just a couple of people um, uh, who are really featured in those pictures, um, where you may want to run up and get a release sign um, if you really, you know, anticipate using a picture that you like. Um, so I know, Joel, you have a lot of experience with this sort of thing with your tournaments. Sure, and uh, I'll do the weasel words and say, opinions are all my own, not my employer. <laughs> uh, that applies for everything we talk about today. Um, but as, as we jump into sort of specifics here, um, there, there's sort of two pieces, right? Um, I, I would say from a, from a content clearance and a distribution standpoint, all of the legal issues around traditional media and distributing content, those all apply. Um, around clearance, third party marks, uh, whether you need broadcast delays, um, standards and practices, uh, sponsorship, right? What does advertising look like to the extent you have it? Is your stream advertising or is it not advertising? Um, those are questions you'll have to, to deal with. Um, but, you know, then when we come down to rights of publicity, yeah, you know, the, everybody wants to use that sort of low friction post a sign at the door, um, but that may not cut it in certain jurisdictions, and it may not cut it based on the use. Um, so, you know, there, there is a need for sort of a sliding scale of, um, you know, the more prominent the feature or the use of, of the, um, the video or the images, the name and likeness, you know, the more explicit the release will need to be, um, and the greater the transparency around consent. Um, I, I always argue as well, right, trust is a huge factor in running any of these things, um, particularly when it comes to kids and their parents. Um, so sort of uh, skimping, skimping on consent uh, doesn't inherently build trust. Uh, so finding, finding ways to still make sure that you don't create too much friction in consent and disclosure um, with, getting, with getting publicity rights cleared. Uh, but making sure that there's a focus on being transparent and building trust. Uh, that will go a long way very practically to reducing risk. Next slide. So privacy issues. Um, Esports players obviously have to supply a lot of um, personal information um, in order to play and to participate in tournaments. So. Um, key questions come up in terms of sort of um, the big um, international, uh, national, um, and, and state uh, and local provisions. Um, so are you, are you collecting personal information from children under 13 um, in a way that's compliant with COPPA? Um, what about GDPR compliance? And then now we've got CCPA and, and other state um, uh, laws that are sort of coming up, coming up the path. So um, I know Joel, you want to talk a little bit about Pokemon here. Yeah, sure. Um, and you know, I we're not going to try and lecture who who are likely privacy experts on this call um, on the specifics, but to you know to mainly cover off right. Privacy is critical in this space, um, and it crops up in interesting ways. A lot of which we've already talked about. Um, one that I always have to remind folks of is, you know, it is it is very popular uh, in esports to have gamer tags, right? Not using actual names but pseudonyms, um, 
that tie into sort of their persona, into player's persona, right? Um, that could be considered personal information, right? It, it individually identifies people um, and it's used broadly. So, uh, you know, folks will know what that means. Um, that will trigger GDPR, COPPA, and CCPA um, concerns. Uh, you know, what, what I will touch on, um, and I'll, I'll at the very end kind of wrap up how we use it a bit more, um, you know, Pokemon has created the Pokemon Trainer Club system. Uh, we've worked with KRU in particular over a lot of years and a lot of great counsel um, to refine it and improve it. Uh, and it's sort of, we consider it the passport. Uh, to entering any of the tournaments uh, that Pokemon runs. Uh, and the first thing is age gating, is getting verified parental consent and creating um, a parent-child account system where at any time a parent can come log in and identify, uh, you know, the issues, or uh, sorry, identify how information is being collected and used and that they can opt in and opt out of that. Um, so that's really at the core of how we bring people into the Pokemon ecosystem, uh, but it sets a foundation so that we can build on that um, through the various different tournaments. Uh, and I am very mindful we've only got a few minutes left. So next slide, please. Uh, I won't go through these in detail because uh, they're COPPA and GDPR and CCPA specifics, um, but things to keep in mind. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, and I, you know, I think I think past presenters from Pokemon and in, in uh, Kira conferences have talked about um, how being COPPA compliant got us ready for GDPR and for CCPA. Um, because a lot of the a lot of the baseline uh, elements were already there, right? And about disclosure and giving people access to their information and the right to opt out. Um, that is still consistently true, uh, and it, it's something that every uh, every publisher operator of tournaments um, organizations running esports needs to keep in mind, right? How do you build uh, to the highest level of compliance and creating um, privacy controls for all layers, knowing, you know, for some brands and for some products that you will definitely have kids, right? That is an answered question uh, when you have kids competing in these games. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll come back around to, to Trainer Club in a little bit. Um, after Melissa, I think you want to say a few words about uh, mobile apps and ad tech. <laughs> Sure. Um, just a couple of considerations here. Um, simply that a lot of these games, we talked about skins gambling um, and skins purchasing before. And so it's important to keep in mind, particularly when you're building new apps um, that you plan to use um, for esports types activities, that um, you know, these in-app purchases um, you need to follow the sort of principles laid out in the settlements with um, the FTC settlements with Amazon and Apple um, in terms of um, making sure that in-app purchases are labeled in a compliant way, that you're obtaining parental consent in a compliant way. Um, you know, you need to make sure that to the extent that you are, um, you know, uh, creating something that's kid-directed, um, you're following the recent um, the principles elucidated in the recent YouTube settlement. Um, you need to make sure um, to the extent that your, um, uh, you need to determine whether your, your content will be considered kids content under sort of the tests that are set out by the FTC, because if, um, if, it, if it is, then you may be strictly liable to, um, for failure to comply with, with COPPA. Um, another, um, just another note that the extent that you're sort of targeting the ed tech field, um, uh, you are also going to need to comply with um, FERPA, the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act, um, which regulates the share, uh, sharing of student records and personal information with third parties. And um, that may be something that is invoked sort of to the extent that you're trying to obtain um, student records from the schools um, uh, or in fact you do, um, then you're gonna need to, to deal with compliance there. Next slide. 
Uh, great. So to invoke an esports expression, I will do a speed run through esports during COVID-19. Um, we will do this very fast. Uh, so yes, uh, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on how esports have operated. Um, their esports are more popular than ever. Uh, viewership is is increasing dramatically, and gameplay, uh, you know, gameplay across all video games really is up as a result of people being quarantined um, inside. Uh, but on the flip side, major tournaments have been canceled or postponed. Um, so sort of the the major marketing buzz and the prize pools may actually take a step back this year um, because social distancing is required. Um, but if there if there's a broader takeaway uh, from an in, a long term industry growth standpoint, I think it's that you can uh, play sports and socially distance if you play esports. Uh, and in some ways, esports have actually been uh, saving grace for more traditional sports uh, with famous you know football, basketball, soccer, um, automotive athletes coming into esports and competing for the first time. Uh, next slide, please. And one more. So for Pokemon, this is what uh, esports in the time of COVID looks like. Uh, this is the Pokemon Players Cup that we launched uh, just a few weeks back. Uh, and we have gone fully remote in our tournament system. Um, and I don't have time to go through all of the craziness that's been involved in setting this up. But, you know, we have, we have our hired casters operating from their rooms, their living rooms and bedrooms. Uh, we have players competing online and submitting user generated content um, that we have had to clear and do third party marks clearance on um, and get the rights to show it in our wrap up videos. Uh, we've had to, uh, you know, leverage the Pokemon Trainer Club account system and all of the privacy uh, elements that we've baked in proactively. Uh, and that has really been unlocked our ability to, uh, to make this thing happen. Um, I will say though, as, as a call out to other folks who are at companies that make uh, online voice and video chat systems that may be on the call. Um, our Players Cup, we've only done it in our master's division, so we don't have um, young kids playing um, because there aren't a lot of third party solutions out there that are specifically targeted at um, voice and video chat systems that are specific to kids or have kids in mind. Um, so there are technology and business limitations out there still um, that are holding back esports and kids in esports a bit. Um, but uh, it, it's been very promising to see this all develop, and a lot of other esports companies are doing similar kind of programs. Um, so there's my brief wrap on uh, on Pokemon Players Cup in the time of COVID. And one more slide. We can skip right through that. That's just an image of what uh, what a tournament looks like right now. It's a pretty rocking image. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. So oh, great. Thank you so much, Joel and Melissa, for a, a really um, interesting and quick deep dive on um, eSports. We really appreciate it. This was kind of a one-on-one -on -one class for everybody, so thank you. Um, I'll wrap up by asking you both um, one final question is where do you see in light of all the laws that you touched on, CCPA and GDPR, where do you see this landscape moving towards in five years? What do you think it'll look like? I'll, I'll go to you, Joel, first. Sure. Uh, in five years, I'm, I'm hoping we have federal privacy legislation uh, in the U.S. Um, it's sort You're of the... You're such an optimist. <laughs> I am such an optimist. Um, I think that would clarify a lot of things, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's sort of the the constant tension of we have a lot of new industry participants right. all learning the ropes, um, both from a business and a legal standpoint. Uh, and so there needs to be some standardization that happens either self-regulatorily or with, you know, new broader legislation. Right. Melissa? Um, well, one thing we didn't talk about was there's a lot going on in the area of esports betting. Um, so I suspect that we're going to start to see more, um, a, a whole lot of state laws on esports generally, um, and sort of esports, regulating esports play, um, along with the esports betting. Um, and so that's, that's going to be something to watch. Um, you know, we talked about sort of the general gambling laws. I think we're going to have more specific laws on esports. Right. Great. Thank you so much. 
Um, and again, thank you both for taking time out of your schedule and Joel, especially you at your undisclosed location um, on your vacation, <laughs> <laughs> joining us. Um, so we have um, the next session is um, I believe August 18th. Yes, August 18th, Safety by Design, Protecting Users of Innovative Mobile Apps. Again, I would encourage you to go to kroconference.org for more information, um, including registration. So I thank all the attendees. I thank all of our sponsors um, for attending today's KRU conference session. Thank you so much and have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.